There was a time in the world when TB was incurable and tantamount to a death sentence. But thankfully today, medical science is so advanced that this disease can be cured within six months. And as the world recognizes World TB Day on the 24th of March, we ask the question, why then do thousands of South Africans and millions around the world continue to die from this condition? Good morning and a very warm welcome to Bonita's House Calling here on SABC2. Mafrika Ramad, Kirit Khomutseu. I'm Dr. Victor Ramatisili. The Nano Nuts is Naka Katu. Little when I have Santa Francis and Sessin, Major Johan Masumaro, Referrales Hora, Yabro Bedi, who see. Now, as we welcome into the studio today, Dr. Lindy Wemfus, who is a cluster manager of TB control and management in the National Department of Health, and Dr. Lizel Page Chief, director of TB programs and at correctional services at the Oram Institute. We're also joined by Dr. Patrick Osero, who's a lead health specialist at the World Bank. Colleagues, thank you ever so much for joining us this morning. Of course, uh, 24th of March, World uh, TB Day. You work with various organizations, and thank you for making the time uh, from a busy schedule, Dr. Osero. World TB Day, why, why, why dedicate a day for to tuberculosis? Because TB is a serious condition. And the global community decided to dedicate a day for us to create awareness and to reflect on this problem, epidemic that uh, is affecting many, many, many countries around the world. And so it's a day to remember those that have died from TB, those that have TB, and those that might get TB. Hmm. Quite interesting. <coughs> Dr. Mbus, I want us to go to the real basics this morning and mm -hmm. talk about TB infection. Mm. We know that tuberculosis is caused by a small hokaki called mycobacterium tuberculosis and it's, it's got many other relatives that we will not go into that. Mm. And that us in South Africa are exposed to this you know bacillus in the air and everywhere we go and that most of us in fact in South Africa <coughs> have had tuberculosis infection in some point or another. Do you want to describe exactly how it comes to us and what happens to us as soon as it hits our bodies? Well, one thing, as you've said, the, um, it's caused by mycobacterium, um, which is spread through the air, basically. So if you are so in... So somebody coughs and it gets into the air. Exactly. Mm. Okay. So then once, if you are in close contact with that person, mm. then you are likely to breathe the air that contains those bacteria. Okay. And once you breathe those, they go into your lungs and they remain in your lungs and multiply. Now they grow but um, uh, in your lungs and your immune system would then come into action and try and protect your body and fight this microbacteria. I see. Now what then happens is if you have a strong immune system, mm -hmm. you would be able to contain the infection so it doesn't spread, it, your, the bacteria will remain in your body but it will not be active. Hold on. So it will remain in your body and it won't cause any infection if your immune is in a good state. Exactly. And does this happen to most of us South Africans now that TB is so common in this country? The majority of, of uh, people are infected early in life. I see. And uh, yes, they will be able to contain the bacteria. But you will find those who are not able to do that because they are not able to fight off the bacteria because their immune system is low. Is low so okay. we find this in most cases amongst children because they are still very young, they have a weak immune system, they are likely to get infected and develop disease. Okay. So, so it does not sit in one corner because your immune, immune system has dealt with it. So in children and in some people who are immunocompromised, as you say, yes. it can lead to an open disease at exactly, that point. at okay. that point. But then you find that again in adults now, those who have whatever condition, disease that might affect their immune system, and then they would also be more susceptible to getting disease. So okay. they are not able to contain the infection and will develop disease. Okay. There are a number of uh, conditions that would result in that. 
the most common being HIV, which is why TB is common amongst people who are living with HIV. And then we have other conditions as well, like diabetes, like um, uh, people who are taking medication for cancers, people who have uh, other chronic conditions where they have to take steroids, for example, for a long time. And steroids and the cancer medications are notorious for... For in suppressing, suppressing the, the immune, immune system and therefore making you susceptible to get it. Hold on, hold on. <coughs> so you're saying most of us, myself, Dr. Osebo, yourselves, everybody, most of us South Africans have been exposed to the TB. The body has dealt with it. Mm -hmm. It's sitting in one corner because our immunity systems are keeping it under check. Exactly. Now, if you test me during that time, if you do the skin test, mm -hmm. it, it will be positive because be I've been exposed to the TB. Exactly. It will test positive because when we do the skin test, we are checking your body's immune system, mm. uh, whether it is effective. And that will actually show us that mm. you've been infected. You've been exposed to tuberculosis. Yes, yeah, okay. but you've been able to contain the infection. Okay. All right, just hold it there now. This is very exciting. So it has, been, it has come into your body, um, and your body has maintained it because you've got a good immunity. Now, there will be situations where your body will happen, something will happen to your body, and this tuberculosis now, or tuberculous bacteria that is sitting, can be reactivated now and actually cause open or overt disease. Mm -hmm. Under what conditions does that happen? So as Dr. Mbusi has said, one of the main reasons is immunosuppression. So as soon as the body can't contain it, it will become reactivated and cause TB disease as opposed to TB infection. Mm -hmm. But also, we can be really, really <coughs> healthy. If we inhale... Hang on, hang on, hang on. So now it becomes TB disease. TB disease. Because the, the immunity that was keeping it under check is now failing, and now it's manifesting itself That's as right. a disease. That's when, disease. in fact, all this time, it has just been an infection because your body has kept it under check. That's right. Interesting. Okay. So that's one way of happening. But mm. it can also happen that you're very healthy, and if you inhale enough bacillary loads, so enough of those germs at any one time, even if you are healthy, you can develop TB. I see. So I think that we are all susceptible regardless of our immune status. Of course, if our immune status is low, we are more susceptible, but any of us can get TB. Okay. Now, when it comes to, to testing, now if somebody has had primary infection, mm -hmm. now or primary exposure or primary infection as it is now, once they have disease, the immune system has failed, and now they're beginning to cough and everything that goes with it, cough, night sweats, loss of weight, loss of appetite, and all of those things. Now, what test would you do now, different to the skin test that we did, to show that now it is a disease, it is no longer an infection? So, right, so it's a different test. In adults, now we try to test the sputum. I see. So most likely, most TB happens in the lungs, so the best specimen to get is a sputum, sputum specimen. We can get TB in other parts of our body, which is more difficult to diagnose, and that's where we need maybe a, a physician, a doctor, to actually do other investigations. But the most common test is a sputum test, especially for people who are coughing up sputum. Okay. Now, if you've got somebody who gives you typical symptoms, says, I'm coughing, cough is worse at night, I've got some mm -hmm. chest pain, I've got loss of weight, I've got night stress. You can't treat that person. You've got to make a diagnosis. You've got to take the sputum, and the sputum must show that it does have the bacillus only then and then only can you start treatment. So ideally, yes. Mm. Unfortunately, it's not an exact science. It's dependent on that sputum actually having a bug in it that the test then picks up. Okay. So we do have patients with TB whose sputums are, sputum is negative. Uh, it doesn't show any it of the bacteria. It doesn't show it on mm. the sputum. But when we assess the whole patient, we do an x-ray, we do other tests, mm. we can decide that actually this is TB. It just hasn't shown up in that particular sputum specimen. Okay. And then we are justified in starting TB treatment. Okay, well. we'll come back to that. Now, obviously, these issues that we are talking about, um, you at the World Bank, you deal not only with disease, but you also deal with the environment. Mm -hmm. Now, what are some of those environmental factors or social factors that will make either primary or secondary TB to be common among, let's look at Africans for a while and, uh, and forget about the rest of the world and be selfish for once. <laughs> like my colleagues have said, uh, TB is transmitted through air. Mm. And so if you live in overcrowded conditions, mm. uh, whereby the, the, your living environments, the, you, there's no uh, ventilation, mm. and somebody has TB in the family and coughs, 
uh, you are likely to get uh, TB because you'll get a very high dosage uh, of the bacteria. Because, and because it is contained. Yes, because because ventilation will get right. the bacteria to move outside a exactly. confined space. Exactly. So if you're in a confined space with, with poor ventilation, that's it right. is a risk factor. So that's okay. why it's important to live in a house that uh, there's sufficient ventilation okay. so that if somebody has TB and they cough, I then see. they still they will go through the air instead of coming to I you see. as okay. a family member. Okay. Uh, the second one is that like, um, um, like my colleagues were saying, if you have lower immunity, but you have access to healthcare. For example, if you have diabetes mm. and you have access to healthcare and your diabetes is controlled, that dormant TB uh, bacillus bacteria will not activate. But if you do not have access to good healthcare, it becomes a problem because then your Im immunity is, uh, is decreased and therefore the TB becomes active. So access to healthcare is extremely important. Uh, if somebody who has a condition that lowers your immunity is important, that they go and seek medical care so, so those that those conditions, conditions are managed are treated. so that the immunity can, right. can come yeah. up to scratch. And then the other condition, for those who work in the mines, for example, there is a condition called silicosis. This is a, a condition whereby they inhale a dust, a fine dust, that inflames their lungs. And if they have uh, the, the dormant bacteria, it becomes active and then they develop TB. Hold it. We're going to come, we're going to come back to silicosis yeah. when we talk about TB in the mines specifically. Treatment, quickly. Um, well, what is key to treatment is that we need to start treatment early and um, it is uh, a long period for treatment because it takes six to eight months to treat TB, but um, we don't have any better drugs currently. That's the best we can do. And uh, the challenges that we face is that people get tired of taking the medication yeah, quite a long time. and they stop taking the treatment and therefore we need to ensure that there is support throughout the treatment period. And if they have experiencing any problems like side effects once they are taking the treatment, then we need to manage those side effects. And people need to be aware that they need to report those side effects to whoever is treating them so that they could be treated or managed. And the other challenge that we, we face as well, as I indicated earlier on, is that uh, HIV um, is, is is a risk factor for getting TB. So you find that in most cases, if you are HIV positive, you have to take antiretroviral treatment and take TB treatment. It's too much medication mm. for a person to take. And therefore, that constant support is actually required by patients to encourage them to continue taking treatment. Just hold it there, because we're going to be talking about the relationship between HIV and tuberculosis. One is Hobama Swafu here, we're now be able to We'll continue our discussion on the challenges of managing TB. Hang hang out of Kaba Patsu, Hadama Tell. Stay with us. In South Africa, the mining community has been associated with exceptionally high prevalence of various health issues, most notably tuberculosis and other lung diseases. Stop. Lo engine na pelile. Lo engine is clear. The rate of TB infections are particularly high, partly due to HIV infections, poor access to routine health services overcrowded accommodation and secular migration between communities and mining locations, and silicosis resulting from prolonged exposure to silica dust in the mine shafts. Uh, fine stuff. Fine stuff in that. Kakulu kakulu fine stuff. You eat banalio, na na go. U kalangu, u bea, chompor. Yeah, eat. First, if we are 
umoja wa sehemu kutini au kuna pumele safisi unetla ya shalo pumele safisi masibu kipa kuna bedu kwa mshini yako uma ukwetela ya rotata in the case and then if we are pifumula anything we enter you ya rotate no to tip from outside the prolonged hours of work under unbearably extreme heat conditions underground also affects miners mchiso mchiso una wo o tlanga bowe ke sebetsa go tlola after uh, after 8 hours ke tlule we are 9 hours 10 hours 12 hours ningena izo ke so phuma karagwe ka 12 what i fear is the condition of underground it cannot be changed ne? and we as mine workers working underground even if you can try even if you can try to 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 maintain it but it's hard it's very hard for us to, to maintain it because it cannot change it cannot change it's underground and the underground stays as underground Jeez. dr osewe in his recent state of the nation address the President of the Republic, His Excellency Mr. Jacob Mtlanganyela Kelechi Zuma, said and put on point across that this year South Africa is going to spend more time on vulnerable communities to tuberculosis. Quoted correctional services, which is going to tell us more about, spoke about miners and the peri mining communities or communities around the mines. Now, it is quite clear that conditions in the mines actually do make a lot of those miners vulnerable to tuberculosis. What about the mines? We know about silica dust, which you have already referred to, that in mostly in the gold mines, in the process of mining the gold underground, that there's a certain type of dust that is uh, emitted by that process uh, called silica. And when that gets into the lungs, it can affect the lungs, causing a condition called silicosis. Mm -hmm. And that silicosis increases the chance of getting tuberculosis about eight or 10 or even 16 times sometimes. Now, other than that, what else makes miners vulnerable to tuberculosis? The, the, the miners in South Africa uh, come from mostly South Africa, uh, Swaziland, Lesotho, and Mozambique. Okay. And they live uh, in conditions whereby it's difficult to have family members. And so they leave their family members, for example, in Eastern Cape Province, uh, in Lesotho, in Swaziland, and in Mozambique. And they come and work in South Africa for a prolonged period of time. Uh, sometimes they get to go home often, sometimes they don't and that therefore increases the opportunity to engage in high risk behavior that, some, that sometimes might lead to HIV infection. And so HIV infection in the mines yeah. is, is, is particularly high. Yes. And that in itself makes them vulnerable to tuberculosis. Yeah, correct. And then uh, the housing condition in the mines, and some of the mining companies have provided nice housing for the employees, but many mining companies have not still provided uh, accommodation. So you find that uh, they live in hostels that are uh, overcrowded, or sometimes they live in the shacks uh, in the mining communities, in peri-mining communities, uh, that there's a lot of overcrowding, and that also exposes them at, uh, to TB. Sure. What else? Uh, you'd imagine that um, um, if, you look, if we look at the people around the mines, uh, the type of lifestyle, I'm sure mm -hmm. they don't eat well, and alcohol abuse is possibly a little bit dry. Well, uh, what are some of the factors that affect miners? Yes, uh, you've mentioned some. The, the situation under which they live is, is, is not conducive as well for, for their good health. For example, poor nutrition, uh, alcoholism, and uh, smoking as well does uh, contribute and increase their risk to getting TB on top of the exposure to, to silicosis. And um, we, what we also find is that uh, when the minor has TB and goes home, there's the risk again of transmission of at home. And what then happens is that because they are screened in the workplace, they will then access treatment, but then tend to forget about the family members. So one of the things that would be critical, uh, especially in those communities, is to ensure that all the family members of people that screened. have mm. my, uh, TB are actually screened. And if they have TB, then started on treatment as well. What, what does it mean, screening for tuberculosis, exactly? So that's a really good question, because basically it means a symptom screen, a verbal sc symptom screen. So as a healthcare worker, we ask our patients exactly the things you said, cough, are you coughing? Are you losing weight? Do you have night sweats? Do you have fever? 
if any one of those four symptoms is positive, mm. oh, that's just an one. indication, just one. Mm. only anyone, mm. anyone, okay. that is an indication to investigate for TB. Mm. And the first test is usually sputum. Tell us about the gene expert. Uh, everybody has been waxing lyrical about this new test uh, that, is, that is used, and South Africa is one of the biggest consumers of this uh, American originated type of product called the gene expert. W what does it do exactly? So, the expert is a, a new test which is really exciting because it's very sensitive to pick up TB very quickly. So, it is a test done on sputum. The idea is that it only takes two hours to do, but it's still got to get to a laboratory in order to do the test. The test is more sensitive. In other words, it's more likely to pick up TB than the old test we used to use, which was microscopy, okay. where we looked down a microscope. Okay, so, so, so this one, you don't have to look down the microscope and don't. see the TB bacillus itself. That's right. But it, it goes can give, into it can a special indicate, machine, yeah. and it's a, it's a gene test to test for TB. The other advantage is that we, s we can find TB more easily, but we can also find resistance to rifampicin. Just hold it, just hold it, because uh, w I want us to deal with the, with the resistance a little bit more sensitively so that it flows from our discussion. Let's talk about the relationship between HIV and tuberculosis. What exactly happens between the two? Because the two conditions, what actually happens there? Because HIV <coughs> lowers immunity. And once your immunity is lowered, uh, the bacteria that we were talking about earlier becomes active and you develop, uh, you develop TB. Mm -hmm. yeah. But just to add to what she was saying, the gene expert can give you results in two hours. In the past, uh, you had to do a culture, which would take six weeks to get results. So this is a dramatic improvement in the testing uh, the diagnosis of TB. That's why the Minister of Health, Dr. Moseledi, has been pushing that every community should have access to gene experts so that they can get their results very, very quickly. What is culture? Uh, culture is a method where you actually take the sputum that uh, the patient gave you and you grow it in a medium in the lab. Now you find that it, because um, TB is a slow grower, then it takes time for it to actually grow in that medium. And uh, that's why then it takes longer to get the results. So once they've grown it and identified that it is actually TB, then they also test the drugs um, for which we use to treat TB. Whether that bacteria is Whether that bacteria to will grow okay. in that or not. Because when it, if it doesn't grow, then it means that um, that, uh, that uh, the TB is sensitive, but if it still grows in that drug, then it means you are resistant to it. Drug resistant tuberculosis. Do you want to explain the concept? So basically we have four drugs that we treat TB with, the six months or the eight months. Mm -hmm. And if two of those drugs are very strong drugs, the INH and nifampicin, if the bacteria grows in either culture or shows an expert to be resistant, mm -hmm. it means those drugs aren't working. I see. And so then we call that either um, monodrug resistant or multi-drug multi resistant TB. MDR, multi -drug MDR. Drug. So it is a, a TB bacteria or hokaki that does not respond, respond to the normal treatment mm -hmm. that, that is given. So that is called drug resistant. Now that's MDR or multi-drug resistant. Now those patients would have to be put on a different type of medication now. That's right. So then oh. they need many more drugs for much longer. So the I treatment see. of MDR can be 18 months to two years. The drugs that are used are not as effective. We don't have really good drugs yet in a regimen. So it, there's not always a 100% cure rate. Now, who gets the multi-drug resistance? How does that happen? I think this is why it's important that mm. uh, if somebody uh, gets a diagnosis of TB and is put on treatment, mm. that although six months is a long time to take medication, they should ensure that they take their medication as uh, as, prescribed. as prescribed by the doctor and they for the entire it. six months and then they finish it. Because if they stop before they finish the medication and then the, they start again, uh, then the, the bacteria becomes resistant. And then once it's resistant, then you have to be treated for 18 to 24 months. And two years is a long time. And the drugs become more 
toxic. So if you break the treatment yes. or you don't complete it, yes. you, you, the bacteria is still there, yes. and now the bacteria, because it is naughty, yes. it ends up not being affected by the, by, by the uh, uh, antibiotics that you're using or yes. the treatment Correct. that you're using. Correct. Then you call it drug resistant or multi drug resistant. Yes. XTR, is that now a worse form of drug resistance? Or? Yes, uh, it is the worst form of, of drug resistance in mm. that now you are resistant not only to just the drugs that we use to treat mm. uh, drug susceptible TB, you are now resistant to those drugs that, some of the drugs actually that we use to treat MDR TB. <sighs> now we need to try out a different combination of drugs now for those people who have mm. XDR TB. Well, obviously more expensive, more obviously expensive, more inconvenient. More toxic, with and, more and, side and, effects and, 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 and longer. much longer also. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and the other factor is that now once you have MDR or XDR, you then end up transmitting that MDR, MDR now, so some people XDR. get, when they get into first contact with tuberculosis, they, they get into get contact MDR, with the MDR. Yes. And it transmits to family members. You can transmit it to yeah. family members. Yeah. By the way, just before we go to the end, break, one single person uh, who's got tuberculosis has got a, a chance of infecting how many more? I think up to 20 people. Up to 20 people. Yes. So which is why it is important for people, if they suspect that they have TB, mm -hmm. that they should be put on they should be diagnosed quickly and yes. put on treatment because the longer you stay with it, the more people they are going to infect. Correct. Mm -hmm. Oh boy. We'll continue our discussion on the challenges of managing tuberculosis when you return. Welcome back. You're watching Politan's House Corner here on SABC2. And the globe is observing well the TB Day on the 24th of March. And today we are focusing on the challenges of managing tuberculosis in our land as well as in the neighboring countries. Let's watch. Accommodation remains a huge challenge in the hostels due to overcrowding and poor sanitation, with many mine workers opting to move into the slums, in some cases to save living out allowances the results of which has serious health implications, not only to the mine workers, but to the mining communities due to the poor housing conditions in the slums and the risk of spreading TB to the general public. Mine workers narrates how they discovered they had TB infection. Uh, TB, uh, 2010. Uh, <laughs> Even though he successfully completed his treatment in 2011, Mr. Tolang says he was reinfected again in less than two years. August. It was my foot. It was my foot. August. 12 August. Kale udla ma pili. Once diagnosed with TB, mine workers face other enormous challenges. I have three friends who are, who are infected and they are not longer working because their TB is not their TB that is curable. Yes, some other people that I, I, I have worked with them from different shafts until we met from one shaft. But they were, they were sick then. It's, it was very hard for them, just, you know, it's very hard. Yeah, you know, South Africa is a, is a mineral resourced country and mining contributes quite significantly to our general domestic product. And uh, it's quite critical that uh, in an industry like this that we should be able to manage not only tuberculosis but many other conditions. And I think central to this are the living conditions, the wages that the people are receiving, and ensuring that there can be follow-up of treatment with the neighboring countries. Now, I know that you've been involved in many projects, one of which is how you get 
the labor sending countries to the South African mines. You've mentioned them, it is Lesotho, it is Swaziland, it is Mozambique, and of course many others. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with all of these in totality without necessarily isolating South Africa? What has been the progress in that area so far? I think the challenge of TB in the mines is that uh, it's a health condition that uh, is happening in another sector, the mining sector, which yeah. is a major driver of the economies of Southern African countries. Mm -hmm. Uh, mining is a private uh, is a private initiative. Uh, mining companies are private uh, um, companies. Uh, they are regulated uh, by the uh, Department of Minerals, and also mine workers come from far and wide, like you've said. Mm -hmm. And so the challenge is that we need a collective effort that includes the the, the Department of Health, Department of Minerals, the Department of Labour, because these are workers mm -hmm. uh, in the in a sector, and also we need uh, the Department of uh, of Immigration as people move from. The home, home affairs, affairs, yeah, home affairs, affairs yeah. as people move from one country yeah. to another country. So there needs to be collaboration across all these uh, departments, uh, mining companies, mining union, associ association of ex-mine workers across the countries to talk to each other so that if somebody has TB in South Africa, a mine worker has TB in South Africa and crosses over to go to Swaziland, the Ministry of Health in Swaziland should know about it mm -hmm. so that they can continue their treatment, that can continue to support uh, that particular uh, patient so that uh, they complete their treatment because if they don't then they get the resistant TB uh, that uh, we've just talked so you've about. So you've got to do you got to deal with it collectively yes. within the whole region. Exactly. Now tell us a little bit more about this whole project that the, the president announced at the State of the Nation address that there's going to be focused on, on, on mining and miners, pair mining communities and correctional services. How, how is that how is that going to work exactly? Because yeah. I had Minister Mutsu already talking now in, in support of that a few days later that school children are going to be involved in this as well. How is this going to work? Um, well, this is going to, for example, when you look at the mines, we are engaging the mines themselves because those, especially the big mines, provide services. Mm. Those mines would have to then look at ensuring that everyone is screened within the mines, all the workers are screened, and um, and started on treatment if they have TB. Now the other part is what happens when they have to go home uh, on holidays or uh, especially on holidays actually mm -hmm. and they need treatment. So they need to have supply of treatment when they go home and so that they continue to take their treatment. And then when they are medically boarded because they can't go on underground, they need there needs to be treatment and continuation of care when they go back to their homes. Now, when we look at the peri-mining communities, they will need to ensure that all the people that are living within the peri-mining communities are screened at least once annually okay. for TB and then access to testing as well as treatment. Okay. For those that are uh, at high risk of getting TB who are HIV positive or children less than five, they would need to then get TB preventive mm -hmm. treatment where we just treat them with one of the drugs that are used to treat TB, which is isoniazid, for at least six months. Now, are you going to do that to all the children? To all the children that have been exposed okay. to so TB. So you'll do the test to check if they have been exposed. Yes. In other words, they have the primary TB that we spoke about at the exactly. beginning, where they had the infection, but the body has dealt with it. Yes. So it has contained it. It's not leading to an infection. But yes. you still want to give them iron age for, for how If long? they live with a person who's just oh, been I diagnosed see. with If they're living with a person who's got tuberculosis, yes. you've got you to give them the treatment. Exactly. And Correct. those that are just HIV positive, yeah. then those will need to go on IPT. Uh, okay. irrespective of whether they've been exposed or not. Fine. Now let's go back to the mines, uh, one of the most vulnerable populations on metals tuberculosis, and see exactly how our story unfolds. The high rates of HIV transmission among the TB patients also lead to stigmatization amongst TB-infected mine workers who fear that their family members and society may blame them for contracting TB because of its association to HIV. In most of because Mine workers in South Africa have the highest TV in the world with an estimated 3,000 per 100,000 people. 
These numbers far exceed the World Health Organization's health threshold for a health emergency, which is 250 cases per 100,000. The mining industry, um, we have very good TB HIV programs um, and is very competitive to a certain extent with other companies um, and we have good control internally. Um, I think the biggest challenge is that uh, TB is not just in the mining. You know, TB is in the peri mining, TB is in the community. And if it's in the community, the only way to address TB in the community is to all stakeholders, you know, to put their hands together around uh, TB, HIV, um, to address it. The level of education. Yeah. Most of the things when they come, they come with the, with the, with the English words. Some, some other people, they don't understand the, the English word. So it's not easy for them. Even if you can tell, you, you, can, you, can't, you, can't, you can't take, you can't take silly courses and explain it on Svanagalog. Then how am I going to say that? Oh, what is silly courses? Minas Kuluma lo silly courses, Zini lo silly courses. Because there are some people who don't understand the meaning of silly courses. So it's not easy for them to gain an experience or to go further more for information because they know that if they ask about TB people say no go to somewhere some, someone else who will explain it most of the people most of the people that they're working on the mine they have only one tendency some other people they don't care 10% of them they do care 90% of them they don't care I I don't know that the language is still being spoken uh, in some parts of the country but 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 now she, she, the insect has, has laid the story, and uh, insofar as the program uh, that was announced by the, by the, uh, the Honorable uh, His Excellency the President, she's already explained the mining and the peri mining communities. Now, you work specifically with the Oram Institute with uh, people in correctional services. Now, how do they become vulnerable? These are ordinary uh, people who just happened to find themselves on the wrong side of the law, and you know, some of them are sentenced, some of them are awaiting trial. How do they become vulnerable suddenly to tuberculosis? Sure, so there are a number of reasons. The obvious one is the overcrowding in correctional centers where we have far too many people for the buildings that were designed. And of course, ventilation is a problem. Correctional facilities are built for security, not for health. However, there are other factors that we're not always aware of. I think we always have the impression that inmates, once they are admitted to a correctional center, they stay there but actually they move around quite a lot. And so they may get diagnosed with TB in one facility and then move on and not actually take the, the referral with them. They tend not to use the same identity number. And another major factor is someone may be arrested on TB treatment or on HIV treatment. And of course in the police holding cells, they can't access their treatment. Once again, overcrowding, they go from the police holding cells to, as you say, on remand before they're sentenced. And so, they're actually a very, very mobile population and quite difficult to keep track of. So your program, what is it going to do to deal with all of these problems and to prevent tuberculosis and to treat tuberculosis in those who find themselves already infected? Sure, so screening, as we mentioned, the verbal screening. The other thing that we have through the National Department of Health Global Fund program is digital x-ray screening. So in the past, many years ago, we used to use x-rays to diagnose TB. Now that we have digital x-rays, we're starting to reintroduce this because it's a very quick test. It's highly sensitive, so we can see very quickly if someone's got... So I'm going to screen all mm -hmm. uh, 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 offenders, both awaiting trial and sentence for tuberculosis? Absolutely, all inmates. And the plan is to screen them at regular intervals, so not just on entry, but as if we can, to screen them every six months and then when th before they exit, because we also want to make sure that if they are diagnosed with TB, that they don't take it into the community or that they take it with treatment and that they get referred correctly. Is this going to be an ongoing thing or now that it, it is, it's projectized, it will stop at some point and hopefully by that time we'd have diagnosed everybody and have fewer people who don't know their TB status or how it's going to Sure, happen. so the idea is that this is something that will be ongoing. So it's actually legislated that inmates should be screened for okay. TB. So it's going to be legislated that way? So it says one of the rules is mm -hmm. that inmates should be have a TB symptom screen, not a digital x-ray. Mm -hmm. We're hoping with these global fund monies we can actually test this, see how well it works, put in for more funding from different sources to continue if it is a good strategy. Interesting stuff. We'll continue our discussion on the challenges of managing tuberculosis after the break.
Mwanesu kusansa la pelakas tuwa sana tazimu na wapoli Charles House Kolo wa SABC2. Ni nani ngulu kutisita nga kakatu. Kajon herguwa kali fulani fuba kapa tube kura sisi. Yole kaba ibiza kasi ho. Dr. Mfus, now you said this a little bit earlier and I stopped you. Now I'm unleashing you. TB outside the lungs. In other words, extra pulmonary tuberculosis. How do we find tuberculosis outside the lungs and how do you manage that? Um, it is very difficult because it can uh, happen in any organ in the body. Any organ in the body? Yes. The brain, I know the, the brain, back, I know the bones, I know... Yes, uh, the abdomen, the, the heart covering, and uh, it becomes very difficult to actually make the diagnosis. Now, who gets TB outside the lungs? Um, it mainly, it's, it's disseminated TB, it's mainly as a result of not having a, a, a good immune system to fight off the bacteria and therefore it spreads onto the blood and into any of your organs. Would it, would it have, so started, it would it have mainly, started in the lungs before or you can't get it in any other part of the body except the lungs well, as a primary infection? it infection. starts I in see. the lungs and then disseminates to other parts okay. of the body. So you would find it most commonly in children, less under five years of age. And uh, you'd find it mainly, again, in people who are HIV positive. I see. And um, the challenge there, as I indicated, it's actually making that diagnosis of, of uh, extrapulmonary TB. So you find that in most cases, if a person does have symptoms that clearly show that uh, it, it is TB, then they are started on treatment without actually confirming the diagnosis. Some of the tests, like the x-rays, would be done, but they won't show you much except for TB in the bones. And um, there are other tests, like the ultrasound, and if you have meningitis, then they do the, um, see, they pull out the CSF and take it to the lab, cerebral spinal fluid, sorry, and take it to the lab for testing. But in most cases, the majority of patients would be started uh, based on the clinical picture and uh, the examination. The treatment is the same as, as lung TB? The or treatment is, is the same. I see. Uh, but in certain instances, like uh, TB of the bones, you might need to then extend the period of treatment up to nine months. I see. But uh, otherwise, we use the same drugs to treat TB in those patients. Dr. Osa, what business does the World Bank have to do with tuberculosis? Uh, we, the World Bank is a development uh, organization uh, that works across uh, several sectors. Uh, so we work, for example, in South Africa, we work with, uh, uh, with, uh, with, uh, uh, with ESCOM uh, to ensure that uh, improve the electricity supply uh, in, uh, in, in South Africa. Oh, please uh, do. Please <laughs> do. <laughs> <laughs> we need the lights on. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, uh, we work mm. with the Department of Health, uh, mm. and we work across many, many departments, uh, including the Treasury. So as a development organization, we focus on conditions that uh, plunge people in poverty. And TB is a, is a disease of poverty, because if, if you work in a mining sector, for example, uh, and you're a breadwinner for your family, and uh, you get TB, you get laid off because you have TB, for example, or you get a resistance uh, TB that now you can't work anymore because you might expose other people to TB, and then you're asked to go home. Then your family is now plunged into further poverty because they depended on you uh, to take care of them. So because TB is a, is, a, is, a, is a condition that plunges people into poverty, us as a development organization, that's a top priority for us to ensure that we stop the disease from spreading, and therefore uh, the economic situation of individuals is improved. Hmm. Now, Dr. Lizel, do, does TB still form the most common or the commonest manner in which people who are HIV positive die and live this world? Absolutely. Unfortunately, yes. Because we haven't got a grip on either HIV, we don't, not everyone is diagnosed, not everyone is on antiretrovirals. And then our burden of TB is so high and drug-resistant TB. Unfortunately, it is still the, the commonest cause of death in people who are living with HIV. And, and if you have TB and uh, HIV uh, co coexisting in the same patient, uh, the, the, the medications that you use, they don't fight with each other in any sense? So, they, so we now know the regimens. We've studied them, and so we know that the reg which regimens work well together. So we don't have to worry about that. We know that those regimens both work to, to treat the TB and to control the HIV. When I was a student, or maybe a people, sub A, substandard B, I don't know what they call them today, we used to be tested for tuberculosis almost every year. A big bus stands here, you come and you undress and you, they take an x-ray or sometimes they do the skin test. What happened to that? 
Well, I don't know. It, <laughs> it's no longer done, and mm. that's what we want now to bring back to make sure that all children are actually screened for TB every year, and if they have symptoms of TB, be referred for investigation. Can I say on national television that South Africans out there be on the lookout that from the next two years or so, all children in South Africa are going to be screened for tuberculosis. Yes. Brilliant yes. stuff. Bagit, I say, see, Bagit, I get to know in Gobo, in Dogo, Ebantag, and Jogoma situations, or what in Jogo enter into another Ebantag. So, Saturday, Naga, what you know, Solella is for so, but I don't want to get Niboko, Meda, in Kansin, Ibo, Ubala, Lulu, Pelagulu, went to Rosa, I said, Luban, Lulu, Rosa, or Sula, ETP, in Jerula, and I got seven cents in Songa, and some Africa, some more better sick. We'll run about discussion on the challenges of men in tuberculosis when you return. Politics sounds called here on SABC2 and welcome back. Bahais Mohan, William Bora, Morocco, and Telako, Morocco, come for God's tribute. So, Hotto Hobbits and Pebon, the Morabal Edite, Momo Sengua Humpion. Doctor, I say, what key message you want to give to South Africans out there in our fight against tuberculosis? TB is a treatable condition. And if someone has TB, they take their medication properly as prescribed by a doctor. TB can be treated. So my message to South Africans is that TB is a problem in South Africa, but TB is treatable. Take your medication for six months. Do not stop any single dosage and make sure that you complete get you complete your treatment. Dr. Sheik? TB is a problem for all of us. Every single one of us as South Africans, we should all be fighting TB. We need to know our HIV status. We need to get onto antiretrovirals to protect ourselves from TB. As healthcare workers, we need to make sure that we provide a system where people can get their treatment, where they can continue their treatment. It's all of our problem. We all need to take responsibility. What would you say is the responsibility of the general public in, in our Thank you. Uh, it's our responsibility to make sure that if we are coughing, if we don't feel well, that we go to the nearest clinic, that we ask for a TB test. If the TB test is negative and we still don't feel well, we need to go back to the clinic. We need to take responsibility for our own health and make sure that we get a diagnosis and treatment. Dr. Mpuse, it is quite exciting mm -hmm. to hear about the work that uh, the National Department of Health is doing as, in, as well as the provincial departments and obviously the, the district department and the municipalities as well. And that uh, uh, you allowed me to see on national television that in the next year or two, we are going to find children are going to be screened as it used to happen mm -hmm. some 20, 30 years ago, that you are going to have a program that is looking at the correctional services, that is looking at the minors and the paramining communities. What else can we look out for that we expect you to do in our fight against tuberculosis. We'll do our bit as communicators. Yeah. South Africans out there will do their bit, but what can you expect of you? Uh, what we will provide would mainly be the access to the information, first of all, mm. the access to the testing, the treatment, the support that is required to complete your treatment, because what is key is that we need to make sure that once you start taking your treatment, you complete it, and we actually cure you the first time around when when uh, you have And TB. we don't have any comebacks, and we don't have any readmissions, and we don't have exactly. any reactivations, and we don't have resistance. Dr. Mfusi, mm -hmm. thank you very, very much for having joined us this morning. All the very best. I think you need a lot of luck in some of the um, ambitious projects that you are going to undertake with the National Department of Health. Dr. Ship, good luck also working with the correctional services. We have all, more than 150,000 uh, inmates uh, both awaiting trial and sentence in this country and it's going to be a huge challenge in dealing with tuberculosis but I'm sure you're equal to the task and Dr. Osev from the World Bank thank you very much for the work that you're doing not only in South Africa but the region as a whole and of course even SADC as well as uh, some of the other countries around the continent that are affected by tuberculosis and especially those mining areas or the mine labor sending countries uh, to the South African mines thank you very much and we hope that uh, everything from then on We'll work together as South Africans to fight this scourge that is tuberculosis. Banabes, Holona Botle Marati, Batsi Heti, Batha Sendi, Bahotumeti, Igasitana, the man who came by Nanirin. Rotanki Hamu, Tanki Habit, Tanki Hara, El Harpira di Kalahe, and Menola Tabir. We'll be back next Saturday with health and religion. Whoa, 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 whoa. Easter weekend, health and religion, the most relevant topic. So don't miss it here on SBC2 at 8.30 in the morning. Arko Paneng Hape, Baking Yetran. Tato Haile Amre. Thanks for joining us today. From me, Dr. Victor Ramuresi Ramatipele. Ayaya, you take care.